Okay, for the reading in the homily, we are blessed to have Reverend Constant Wilson. Hello and good morning. It's a blessing to be here. I feel honored that I can actually speak again to come and do service with Reverend Beth, Reverend Melinda, and myself. My reading today is a little bit unorthodox. Um, it's called The Stranger in the Lifeboat, and it's by Mitch Albin. And the reading starts chapter 1C, as in the sea. When we pulled him from the water, he didn't have a scratch on him. That's the first thing I noticed. The rest of us were all gashes and bruises, but he was unmarked. And with smooth almond skin and thick, dark hair matted by seawater. He was bare chested, not particularly muscular, maybe 20 years old. And his eyes were pale blue, the color you imagine the ocean to be when you dream of a tropical vacation, not the endless gray waves that surround this covered lifeboat waiting for us like an open grave. Forgive me for such despair, my love. It's been three days since the galaxy sank. No one has come looking for us. I tried to stay positive, to believe rescue is near. But we are short on food and water. The sharks have been spotted. I see surrender in the eyes of many aboard. The words we're going to die have been uttered too many times. If that is to be, if this is indeed my end, I am writing to you in these pages of this notebook, Annabella, and hope you might somehow read them after I'm gone. I need to tell you something. I need to tell the world as well. I could begin with why I was on the galaxy that night or Dobby's plan of my deep sense of guilt at the yacht exploding, even though I could not be sure of what happened. But for now, the story must begin with this morning when we pulled the young stranger from the sea. He wore no life jacket, nor was he holding on to anything when we spotted him bobbing in the waves. We let him catch his breath, and from our various perches in the boat, we introduced ourselves. Lambert, the boss, spoke first, saying, Jackson Lambert, I owned the galaxy. Then came Nevin, the tall Brit, who apologized that he could not rise for a proper welcome having gashed his leg trying to escape the sinking vessel. Jerry just nodded and balled up the line she had been using to tug the man in. Yanis offered a weak handshake. Nina mumbled, hi. Mrs. Laghair, the woman from India, said nothing. She didn't seem to trust the newcomer. John Philippe, the Haitian cook, smiled and said, welcome, brother but kept the palm on the shoulder of his sleeping wife, Bernadette, who was wounded from the explosion, badly wounded, I believe. The little girl we call Alice, who hasn't spoken since we found her clinging to a deck chair in the ocean, remained silent. I went last. Benji, I said, my name is Benji. For some reason, my voice caught in my throat. He, we waited for the stranger to respond, but he just looked at us, doe-eyed. Lambert said, he's probably in shock. Nevin yelled, how long were you in the water? Perhaps thinking a raised voice would snap him into sense. When he didn't answer, Nina touched his shoulder and said, well, thank the Lord we found you in which the man replied, I am the Lord. And he whispered those words. 
chapter, the sea. This is what I found in my notebook the morning John Philippe disappeared. Dear Benji, when you were sleeping, I think a lot. I reach into the water to touch the blue light. Suddenly, I see a big fish. It swims close to the boat. I take the paddle and I wait. It comes back and I hit it hard. I hit it just right. It stopped swimming and I grabbed it. I feel happy because there is fish to eat, but sad because I kill it. I don't want to be in this world anymore, Benji. Take me things. I want the last thing I do to be in giving. You and the others, please eat the fish, stay alive. I want to be with my Bernadette. I know she is safe. I think last night she let me see heaven. She is saying, God waits for me. I pray to get to him. I leave the fish in the bag. May the Lord protect you, my friend. I closed the notebook and dropped my head. I cried so hard my chest hurt, but my eyes stayed dry as dust. This is how empty I have become, Annabelle. I have no water left for tears. That was yesterday. When I told Jerry, she took the notebook, read the words herself, then handed it back to me and went straight for the ditch bag. The fish was large, as John Philippe had promised, a Dorado, Jerry said. Using her knife, she quickly dissected it into edible and useful pieces and Save the rest. The five of us ate some right away. The five of us. Can you really, can this really be true? When Jerry used a piece of line to hang the remaining fleshy pieces, they will dry in the sun and feed us for another two, maybe three days. I was starting at, I was staring, excuse me, at the pieces and grieving for John Philippe when the Lord slid over and leaned against the raft edge. His mop of hair was wet and shiny and his dark beard was now quite dry. Did you think about John Philippe, I whispered. I don't know all things. How could you let him take his life? Why didn't you talk him out of it? He looked me straight in my eyes. Why didn't you? I began shaking in rage. Me? I couldn't. I don't know. I was something he decided to do on his own. That's right, the Lord said softly. He decided to do it on his own. I glared at him then, this haughty, delusional stranger enjoying acting as if he manipulated the world. world. At that moment, I felt nothing but contempt. If you are really God, I see, you would have stopped him. He looked at the sea and shook his head. God starts things, he said. Man, stop. Uh, man stops them. And can you imagine me reading this book by the pool with the girls? I'm crying constantly because it hits home. And the homily today is about choices. And that one line, I had talked to Beth, I had talked to Melinda, God start things, man stops them. I go, I got my homily. I'm ready to come back to service. Can I please give the homily? And they said, yes. God starts things, man stops them. Powerful words when you think about it. I had watched an interview with Mitch Album about his new book, The Stranger in the Lifeboat. He explained this book as a message of hope. As I turned the pages, yes, it was about hope, but every character in the book had to make a mental and moral choice. Spirit, the all, the oneness source, beloved God, gives us opportunities every day it's all about the timing and how we interpret the message of the choice and if we're going to act on it. 
Making choices is a very broad subject. It weighs in and on our moral standards, our culture, and belief system. We make choices every day, good, bad, or indifferent. But are the choices we make for ourselves uplifting? Or are, or are they to make someone else happy? Do we dwell in the choices we made in the past? Do we choose to move forward? Did our choices we made throughout our lifetime define us now? Everything changes in a split second. When making positive choices, anything and everything is possible. Here are some quotes that I was looking for inspiration. You are free to make whatever choice you want, but you are not free from the consequences of that choice. God will not automatically give you the answers. He allows you to make choices. We make our choices, then our choices make us. May your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. Our spiritual choices reflect us like a mirror. Do we practice spiritual choices every day? It is hard some days than others. We are living in our spiritual potential, or are we living in our spiritual potential? It's all about choice. We make spiritual, what spiritual choices would make everyone, all of us, happy? Is it knowing that the all spirit, the oneness source, the loved God is always by us? Does that make us happy? Is that a choice that we are using? That we surround ourselves with like-minded people. We all made the choice to be here right now this morning at this moment. Do we choose to lift ourselves up when there is nothing that's going right. I say yes. We are spiritual beings open to all the wonders in every universe, on every plane of existence. It's our love for ourselves that direct us into making the right choices. We may or may not get an immediate solution or gratification but the choices we make echo always around us. We as a spiritual community do set an example. Sometimes we're under a microscope. Sometimes that spotlight is on us. People we come into contact with do watch to see how we react to their choices. Some of the choices people make, and I know you know this, is for shock value. They just wanna see us as spiritual beings, our response. And that the response can come from family, friends, coworkers, or strangers. Positive examples of how we could react is always in beauty, grace, love, and kindness. At our last service, Reverend Beth spoke about gratitude, starting a gratitude journal, to write in every day. Now make a space on that page and write, my spiritual choice for today is, and here are some examples. I choose, set a set time for meditation, practice self-love, read sacred texts, reach out to a friend, see the beauty that's always been there, but really notice it now that's all around you. It seems like it's a never 
ending tug of war. But when your choices come from a place of love, all things are possible. The outcome will always be a blessing. There will never be room for doubt in any choice decision that you make when your choices are for the highest good of not just yourself, but for all. Good for all. The choices that are made by everyone affects the universe's energy flow, the planets, all beings, everything that is. What a sacred gift that was given to us by spirit, source, the oneness, beloved God, whichever name you resonate to. And always remember the possibilities of choice are endless. Thank you. And you have to get that book because I've never read him before. And for an author to bring me to tears, that's a biggie. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Connie.